Hi, my name is Dr. McKay. I'm Professor Emeritus with the Department of Environmental and Public Health Sciences at the University of Cincinnati. A little bit of background. I was originally trained as a pulmonary toxicologist, but I currently have more than 35 years experience in respiratory protection, including research, clinical practice, and hands-on respirator fit testing. Some of my respirator committee work includes that of the American Industrial Hygiene Association's Respiratory Protection Committee and the American National Standards Institute Z88 Committee on Respiratory Protection Programs, as well as past chair of Z88.10 on respirator fit test methods. This presentation is on how to administer respirator fit tests using sweet or bitter fit test solutions. So while this presentation will demonstrate how to administer, in other words, how to conduct, conduct an OSHA compliant qualitative respirator fit test using what we call saccharin, better known as sweet, or bitrex, also known as bitter fit test agents, I think it's important to keep in mind the following, and that is there are other requirements for fit testing. Um, this presentation does not cover all topics related to fit testing. For example, some of the topics that are not covered are employer, employer requirements for fit testing, who must be fit tested, when the fit testing must be conducted, the frequency of these tests, record keeping requirements, although I'll go through the record keeping for this particular method, how to select a face piece to be used for fit testing, how to evaluate respirator fit and positioning, although I'll cover that for this specific model that we'll be demonstrating, how to conduct user seal checks, which are specific for each make and model respirator, regulatory requirements regarding facial hair and other potential interferences, and then there are many other respirator requirements that a fit tester should be aware of. So to begin with, what is a qualitative fit test? Well, the OSHA definition of a qualitative fit test is it is a pass-fail test that relies on the subject's sensory response to detect a challenge agent. In this particular case, the challenge agent we're going to use will either be, be a substance that has a sweet taste, that would be saccharin, or a bitter taste that will be a substance called bitrex. These fit test kits come in different configurations. The original kit was developed by the 3M Corporation and it's shown on the left part of this slide. However, since 3M developed this kit, other respirator manufacturers and other respirator suppliers have developed their own kits that have similar equipment, they work the same way, nebulizers are the same, but they may have different colors or different configurations to give them a little bit of a different appearance. But other than that, they're the same. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to conduct a qualitative respirator fit test in accordance with the OSHA respiratory protection standard. The specific step-by-step -step guidelines are in 29 CFR, 1910.134. And in that respirator standard, there is a mandatory Appendix A in which you will find these specific steps. There is the sweetener method, also known as the saccharin solution aerosol method in the standard, is in Section 3, whereas the Bitrex solution method, the bitter test, is in Section 4. And although they are in different sections, the thing to keep in mind is the test procedures, the equipment are identical for both. The only thing that's different is one solution is made with a sweetener, the other solution is made with a bitter agent. You simply buy those when you get purchased the kits and you use whichever solution you have available. If you want to download or get a copy of this respiratory protection standard, simply go to OSHA.gov put in the, in the search box, put in 1910.134, or put in respiratory protection standard, 
and it will be the very first item that will appear. So let me give you the big picture first on how this test is conducted. I say it has two phases. The first phase is what the OSHA standard calls taste threshold screening. And the important thing to remember about this phase is this is conducted without a respirator being worn. And in this picture here, we see an individual where there is something over her head. We call that a fit test enclosure. Some people may call it a hood, but that is not a respirator. In the second phase, what's going to be, what will be done is the person will don the respirator that they need to wear in their workplace. And then once they have that respirator donned, then we will administer that the, what we call the fit test agent while the respirator is on. The difference here is that the solution used during phase two with the respirator on is 100 times more concentrated or has a 100 time greater taste response than the weaker solution. And so this helps us to establish that this respirator fits if the individual does not taste that stronger solution. So let's go a little bit more detail through this phase one. So the purpose here is to determine if the subject can detect the test agent, because not everybody can. The great majority of people will be able to test the agent, but not everybody. When we do this taste threshold screening, we're going to use that weak solution I mentioned previously. No respirator is going to be worn, and we're going to spray it in a certain manner into the enclosure that will be placed over their head and resting on their shoulders. When we administer the spray, we'll ask that person if they detect the sweet or the bitter taste, depending upon which agent we're using. And then, depending upon when they taste that substance, we will record the taste number as either a 10, a 20, or a 30, as you'll see in a moment. If the subject cannot detect the taste of the agent that you're using, then what you can do is try the alternative agent. So if you're using sweetener, and the person can't taste the sweetener, there's a pretty good chance that if you switch over to the bitter agent, they will be able to detect the bitter agent. In either case, if they cannot detect the weak solution, then this test method cannot be used for respirator fit testing. So going back to this threshold sensitivity screening process, if the subject detects the weak screening solution within the first 10 squeezes, let's say six, we're going to record that as a 10. If the person detects that taste between 11 and 20 squeezes, we're going to record that as a 20. And then lastly, if they detect it between 21 and 30 squeezes, we will record that as a 30. If they cannot detect it by 30 squeezes, OSHA says this method cannot be used. In my personal opinion, if a person is unable to detect it after 20 squeezes, by 20 squeezes, I would not use this method. Comment I would like to make is before starting the fit test procedure with the strong solution, you want to make sure the subject can no longer taste the sweetener or the bitter agent because there may be a residue that is remaining on their lips or on their cheeks. Otherwise, if that residue is persistent on the lips, that person may inadvertently touch with their tongue, may touch their lip, and then get a false positive test. So what we'll be doing is, after the threshold screening procedure, we will, to remove that residual taste, have the subject rinse his or her mouth with plain water and use a wet towel to wipe the lips in the surrounding area. Once that taste threshold screening procedure is completed, then we can go on to the second phase with the stronger solution, which is 100 times higher in a taste threshold response, or in the case of saccharin, it's actually 100-fold more concentrated. Prior to this test beginning, 
OSHA points out that the test subject, that's the person wearing the respirator, may not eat, drink, anything except plain water, smoke, or chew gum for at least 15 minutes prior to the test. This method requires that the respirator must be equipped with a NIOSH-approved particulate filter, such as a P100 or an N95. On the left side of the screen, we can see that the worker is actually wearing a N95 filtering face piece respirator. On the right side of the screen, we see another individual that is wearing an elastic Merrick face piece. It's a half mask respirator. And this respirator is equipped with a chemical cartridge, but it also has an N95 particulate filter attached to it. NIOSH requires that a particulate filter be attached for the purposes of this test. This filter will stop the test agent from moving through into this respirator. Therefore, if the worker does detect a taste, the presumption would be either that there is leakage at the sealing surface or damage to the respirator itself. Prior to the fit test, the fit tester, as well as the individual, should have inspected the respirator to eliminate damage, but they may not always find the source of the damage. If the subject, when the subject comes to you, if they present with an elastic meric face piece having a chemical cartridge, then that chemical cartridge may need to be removed. For example, the worker that you'll see later in this demonstration, a couple of months ago, had been fit tested um, to wear an elastic meric respirator like this one here. And when he is at work, he is using an organic vapor cartridge to remove the contaminants at his work site. So this is what he needs to wear at work. However, when he presented for the fit test, what I did is I had to remove these cartridges and then replace it in this case, with a, what's called a P100 particulate filter. And now with the particulate filter, we have a filter that will stop the penetration of the sweetener or the bit Bittrex agent from passing through. Alternatively, with the sweetener and Bittrex kit, I could attach an N95 filter. In fact, any NIOSH-approved particulate filter can be used for the purposes of the fit test. So let's say I were to conduct the fit test with this particulate filter on and that the worker passed with this respirator. At the conclusion of the test, what I would do is I would remove the particulate filter because that belongs to me, the fit tester. I will remove it. and then return that respirator face piece to the worker. And then at this point, the employer who will, will determine what type of cartridge or filter he or she needs for various locations within their work site, and then the worker will attach whatever cartridge or filter or combination cartridge or filter they need to protect themselves at that work site. So, once we have assembled a particulate filter onto the elastic meric face piece, if that's being used, then the person is going to don the respirator, complete all the procedures that are applicable to all fit test methods, such as seal checks, putting on their safety glasses, other things that may potentially cause interference. And then what we will do is we will position this over their head have it rest on their shoulders, and then instruct the subject to breathe through the mouth, and then the fit test operator will insert the nebulizer into the small hole in the front of the enclosure, and then spray the appropriate number of squeezes, which would be the 10, 20, or 30, based upon the number, based upon the taste response during that threshold screening. Because 
this aerosol that's being delivered inside the enclosure is diminishing over time, we need to replenish that concentration. And so the OSHA standard requires that after the initial number of squeezes, let's say 10, then every 30 seconds we need to replenish that airborne concentration. So there are seven exercises in the OSHA standard, each of these exercises in one minute in length. And so the person will begin with normal with six, record that as a 10, will start off 30 seconds later because the airborne concentration is settling out, then we'll give another five squeezes. At the one minute mark, we switch to a new exercise, which will be deep breathing. We replenish the concentration at the start of that exercise with five squeezes, and then 30 seconds later, give another five squeezes. And then we'll continue that process for each of the exercises, turning the head from one side to the other side, instructing that person to make sure they inhale at least one time when their head is turned, looking over the other shoulder, breathing, breathing in and out, and then repeating that process, making sure they inhale at the extreme positions. At the end of the one minute, they will look up towards the ceiling, breathe in and out two times, and then they will look down and breathe in and out one or two times. And then you'll repeat that process looking up and down. And then the next exercise is what we call talking. And so at that point, I will hand them a copy of what we call the rainbow passage. Or if the individual has difficulty reading for one reason or another, uh, we could have them do talking. They can recite something they're familiar with. They could do counting. They can do letters of the alphabet in any order. They could also do months of the year, something that they're familiar with. The key is they need to speak loud and clear when they're doing the talking exercise. With the bending exercise, the individual is, well, we're going to spray it a couple of times first. Then they're going to bend over at the waist, allow gravity to influence that respirator, especially if it's an elastomeric respirator. Let gravity have its impact on those straps. And then they'll breathe in and out one or two times. And then they'll have them come up. For motion, go right back down again, breathe in and out one or two times, and then repeat that process. So during the bending exercise, that enclosure may want to fall off. So we'll often have that person hold the enclosure so it doesn't fall off their head when they have their face parallel to the ground. And then if they cannot do that bending exercise for one reason or another, perhaps they have a back injury or some other injury that prevents them from doing that, we can also have them do jog in place. So the, either of those two exercises can be used. And then we end up with the last normal breathing exercise, which again is for one minute. So to repeat, initially we're going to spray 10, 20, or 30 squeezes based on that threshold sensitivity screening response. And then we'll maintain that challenge concentration but every 30 seconds by spraying one half of that original number. And here is a copy of that rainbow passage that we will tip that can be read uh, for the talking exercise. The rainbow passage is also in the OSHA standard um, in Appendix A. Let me make a comment about donning and doffing of a respirator. Always follow manufacturer's written instructions. Keep in mind, instructions can vary with manufacturer and even within different models for the same manufacturer. Recognize these instructions may also need to be modified, especially doffing of a respirator, that's removal of a respirator, for specific contaminants, for example, biologicals workplace and user factors. So let's go ahead and do a demonstration. Uh, today we have uh, Glenn. Glenn, as I mentioned previously, had been fit tested to an elastomeric face piece uh, similar to this one here. But now he needs to wear an N95 filtering face piece respirator uh, for a different location at his job site. So 
Previously, Glenn had looked at several different make and model respirators, and this is the one that he felt had the, um, was the most comfortable, the one that had the best fitting characteristics for him, and now we're going to conduct a sweetener fit test to be able to verify that that respirator does, in fact, fit his facial features. So to begin with, the very first thing we, I need to do is I need to go ahead and set up my equipment. And I'm going to begin with the weak taste threshold sensitivity screening solution. So this is um, the nebulizer. The nebulizer has a screw on top. In this case, the manufacturer labels the top. Um, but I also like to label the bottom because if I take this top off, so this has taste threshold screening sensitivity written at the top. Um, but if I, I might mix this up with the other one, um, or I may mix up the bottom. So I like to mark both the bottom of my nebulizers as well as the top so I don't mix them up. Now what I'm going to do is take my weak solution. So you purchase these. This one happens to be the saccharin, the sweet solution. I'm going to pour the weak sweetener solution into what we call the reservoir on this handheld nebulizer. When if you look, when you have one yourself, you'll notice that the nebulizer has an O-ring. It will either be colored black or gray. You don't want to put the liquid above that O-ring. That is what makes a seal with the top of the nebulizer. Before I put this on, however, is these nebulizers have a tendency to clog. So I'm just going to, uh, first of all, make sure there's this little, we call this a question mark. It's a jet. This is what um, helps create the aerosol. I'm going to make sure that that's pushed down all the way first. And then I'm going to make sure that there's no clogging. So I'm simply going to hold it in front of me and spray. And if I compress the squeeze bulb, I should see an aerosol be delivered. So that looks really good. Now I'll take the top, making sure that I have the correct one. So I have the number one on both the top and the bottom. And I'm going to put this down for a moment. Now what I'm going to do is take the enclosure. So um, when you buy the test kits, they only come with one enclosure. Um, my recommendation is to purchase a second enclosure. And I like to label the one enclosure weak, um, or well one, knowing that I have to use it first. And then I have a second enclosure that's labeled number two for strong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this enclosure. I'm going to place it over the subject's head. I'm going to have it leaning forward the enclosure so that the plastic is not right up against his face. Now I'm going to take the weak solution and I am going to spray the weak solution, but I'm going to ask him to breathe with his mouth open because this is an agent that has a taste response. However, when I do this, I don't want to take the nebulizer with his mouth open and spray it directly into his mouth. It's best to envision where the sealing surfaces are on the respirator and try and spray around the periphery of the respirator. If you at any moment need to approach the person's eyes, you may want to ha remind them to close their eyes if you're going to be spraying it where the respirator makes contact around the nose. So Glenn, I'm going to have you just breathe with your mouth open. Breathe through your mouth and let me know when you detect a sweet taste. Yeah. OK, so that was three squeezes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the enclosure, take it off. And I am going to offer him, I have a bottle of water here and a clean towel. Um, obviously, if he had a sink or a restroom nearby, but for the video, I'm going to offer him the towel and the water, have him 
just put some of that water on the towel and I want to have him rinse his lips and surrounding cheek area to get any residual material off of his face. And then in addition he can take the water and take a drink, slosh it around in his mouth and this is where a restroom is preferable. Um, in this case it's sweetener, he can go ahead and, and have a sip and, and swallow it. Um, or in a restroom you can spit it out and you may want to prefer to, if you were using the bitter agent you probably would want to um, spit that out. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Glenn put on Don the respirator that he selected earlier. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get a respirator too. So he's already received formal respirator training but I'm going to use this as an opportunity as a reminder. So the respirator he selected is in this box here. I believe that you brought your respirator with you. I'm going to come in and take out a respirator and just give him a couple of reminders. It doesn't hurt, especially if the person's never been fitted before, to give him more than one opportunity to, to put it on. Um, so you can go ahead and take your respirator, Glenn, and I'm going to have you hold it. So every manufacturer can have different instructions. In this particular one, um, you'll have it in placed in the um, palm of your hand. The straps are dangling beneath it. And then what the manufacturer says is they want you to take the chin and put it in what we call the chin cup, and then reach over, find the top strap, and bring that up and over onto the crown of your head. And then you'll reach down, find the bottom strap, pull that all the way over your head, over your ears, so it comes beneath your ears, and then along your neck. And then I like to grab the strap and just kind of use my fingers to kind of keep them from getting twisted. You may not be able to be perfect, um, that may have a slight twist with a filtering face piece. Do the same with the top, grab it by the respirator, and then just run that finger along to try and keep it from being twisted. The key is this top strap should be at the crown of the head. That gives you the maximum amount of tension on your face. And then using both hands, not one hand, but using both hands, we don't want to pinch this metal nose band. Now not all filtering face pieces have metal nose bands. This one does. So we want to take our fingers and we want to progressively mold that metal nose band along the hard part of your nose. And then after you do that progressively, sometimes, not in every case, I may ask that worker to do what's called a little tuck, where they just push in along the sides being careful not to create an A-frame by pinching it with one hand. Mm -hmm. Once you believe that you, do you think you have it positioned properly? Mm -hmm. Okay, so once it's positioned properly, then we'll do what's called a seal check. Um, every respirator, especially filtering face piece respirators, have different instructions by the manufacturer. So for this particular face piece, the manufacturer says that you should use the palm of your hands to cover as much of the face piece material as you can. Don't push in around the edges, so you don't want to do this. You want to cover as best you can. And then you're going to exhale sharply, so it's cover and blow. <sighs> Although this particular manufacturer with this model doesn't say to inhale, I like to have the person inhale too, so breathe in and blow it out again. So did you feel any air leak anywhere around the ceiling down. surfaces? Okay, so that's good. So that appears that this respirator may have the right shape and be the right size to fit your facial features. So leave your respirator on. The OSHA standard requires that the person leave the respirator on for what we call a comfort assessment period. And I'm going to use that time period to enter information into software that I have to assist me in conducting this test. So you'll be doing this later, but to remove the respirator, I'm going to hold the respirator in position, grab the bottom strap, pull it up over my head and over, being careful, careful not to snap it, reach up, 
find the top strap, pull it over, and then remove the respirator. So I'm going to come over to my software here. I'm using something called QualFit software. And with this software, I'm going to come over here to um, search. I'm going to, well, already have your, put in the letters of your last name and it already found you. I'll double click that. So now I have um, your name and your ID number in here, but I need to let the software know what respirator you have. So I'm going to come over here for make, use the drop down window. This is a 3M product. Um, but 3M makes a variety of different models. This one happens to be called an 8210 plus. So I've previously tested that face piece. I have that model in here. So I'll select that model. And now I need to identify the style. So we have half masks. We have N95 filtering face piece respirators. So I'm going to identify this as an N95 half mask. And then respirators come in a wide variety of sizes. This particular model comes in one size. And so that's when I normally will look at the box, see how does that manufacturer identify it. And for this particular manufacturer, um, they call that a regular. So I'll select regular. And then um, the name of the, what's the name of the company you work for? University of Cincinnati. Okay, so I'm going to put in, I've tested people at the University of Cincinnati before. Um, so I will enter that. And then um, what city and state, where is the University of Cincinnati located? Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati, good old, you forgot the good old oh, good Cincinnati, old Ohio. Ohio. So now I've entered his name, his ID number, his employee number. I put in the make, model, style, and size of this respirator. And then not required by OSHA, I um, identified the company he's working with and the location that he is at. But I've also accomplished something else here. Prior to, after you put the respirator on, you don't immediately just jump to the first squeeze. We want the person to have the respirator on for a period of time. My job really should be um, also watching you during this process, making sure I don't see any slippage walking around, make sure that I don't see that the straps are improperly positioned. And then what I'm going to go ahead and do is um, we'll go ahead and begin the fit test. So several minutes have gone by. Um, I'm going to come over here and click the tab that says threshold screening. So I'm going to take my enclosure. I'm going to rest it on top of your head, puff it out so I have it leaning forward a little bit. And now I'm going to take, now remember we're going through this comfort assessment period here. So while you're just breathing normally, I'm going to put the strong solution in this nebulizer. Let me just check that one again. The strong solution in particular has a tendency to clog. In fact, I cleaned them thoroughly um, yesterday. Then I came in this morning and they were clogged even though I thought I cleaned them pretty well. And when I used to have staff working for me, I used to say, hey, how come you guys aren't cleaning these nebulizers? And then I found out they were. They have a strong tendency to clog. So uh, what we're going to do is since you needed three, we're going to use the recorded number as 10. So I'm going to begin by squeezing this 10 times. So we entered the threshold screening. We're going to put the threshold screening response. He had three squeezes. It is saccharin. I'm going to come over here and hit the fit test tab. So the instructions remind me, make sure that he's done the respirator, which he's done that he's conducted his seal checks, the enclosure is over his head, and now to begin, I'm going to hit the start button. And it says to do normal breathing and administer 10 squeezes. First squeeze, one, come over to the side, two, 
3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now at any time, Glenn, if you detect that sweet taste, you let me go. The software says I have one more second. It just beeped and it says continue normal breathing but administer another five squeezes. So now I'll do another five. That's one, two, three, four, five. So we have eight seconds remaining, six seconds remaining, five seconds remaining. Um, when this beeps, now then I'll have you do what's called deep breathing. So it just um, beeped. I want you to take nice, good, deep breaths, and I'm going to administer another five squeezes. So that's one, two, three, four, five. So continue the deep breathing. We have 10 seconds remaining. When you're working hard, you're breathing deeper. That's a greater driving force for a contaminant to come in. That's what we want to evaluate. So just have a beep just came up. So we need to go ahead and replenish that concentration with another five squeezes. Two, three, four, five. So we have another 10 seconds of deep breathing remaining. If you kind of get lightheaded, slow down and regain a comfortable breath. But we'd like you to maintain the deep breathing if possible. So now it just beeped. I'm going to have you turn your head. So I want you to look over one shoulder. And I'm going to spray five times. So I'm going to take advantage now. I'm going to go right on this side of the respirator while he's looking to that side. Then turn your head, look over the other shoulder. And now I can get my third, my fourth, and I'll do my fifth squeeze. And now I'm continue turning your head from one side to the other. So I'm taking advantage now when his head is turned in that enclosure that I'm actually able to challenge a part of the face piece we may not have been able to get to previously. Turn your, continue to turn your head. So I'll replenish the concentration. I'll do three this time. There's three, four, five. Continue to turn your head. So you have 12 seconds of going from one side to the other side. Make sure that you actually inhale when your head is turned. Of course, this is normal breathing, so breathe comfortably. So now it just beat. Now this is going to have you look up. So look up. And I'm going to try now. I don't want to tilt this nebulizer, but I'm going to try and get under that chin. Two, three, four. Five, and then look down and breathe in and out two times. And then repeat that process of breathing twice at both positions. So we have one second left. So I'm going to have you close your eyes. I want to make sure that I, ch and look down. I want to make sure that I challenge by that nose bridge. That's a very common leak site. So I'm going to do five squeezes, directing it towards your nose. Um, you can open up your eyes and continue with that up and down, breathing twice at both positions. So ideally, I want to distribute the sprays at, um, by the bridge of the nose and down by the chin. The important thing is you're looking up, breathing in and out two times, looking down. And now we're going to do talking. So I'm going to begin with five sprays here. That's going to be one, two, three, four, Five, and I'm going to have you read this rainbow passage, if you can see it, Glenn, out loud. Rainbow passage. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long, round arch. You continue talking. I'm going to spray five more. With its path high above and its ends apparently beyond the horizon, there is, according to legend, a boiling pot of gold at each end, at one end. People look, but no one is ever finds it. When a man looking, is looking for something beyond his reach, his friends say he is looking for the pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. Very good. OK. So are you do you detect a taste at any time yet? No, no. OK, great. 
All right, so it just beeped. Um, now what I'm going to do is going to do a couple, five more sprays. One, two, three, four, five. Now I'm going to have you bend. Look towards the floor, breathe in and out two times, then come up for motion. And then let's go right back down again for motion. Breathe in and out two times. And then we're going to repeat that process for the entire one minute. So my software just beeped. Now when you come up, let me get another five sprays in there, Glenn. So one, two, three, four, five, and then continue that bending exercise. So we have nine seconds of bending remaining. And then once again, if you detect that sweet taste, let me know. And now we do normal breathing. So this is the last exercise. So another five squeezes. Breathe normal, looking straight ahead. No talking on this exercise unless you detect a leak or you have a medical problem. Other than that, normal breathing, looking straight ahead. So it's kind of hard to instruct and administer the test at the same time. Um, but so time just came up. Did the test pass? The answer is yes. I'll hit yes. Um, and let me just, this is not part of the OSHA standard. Um, but it's something I recommend, ANSI recommends, and ISO recommends. I'm just going to have you reach up. So just kind of reach up there. And with your finger, break the seal of that respirator. And I'm going to give you another two squeezes. And OK, great. All right. So now you know there's actually something in here. Yeah. OK, good. So you can take the enclosure off. I'll take that from you. And you can remove the respirator as you were trained. So you'll take the top strap, pull that over your head, reach back, grab the bottom strap. And then, uh, so that make, model, style, and size fits you. Um, and you can keep it. You can use it. You don't have to throw it away right now. Good. Okay. Good. So do you have any questions about the fit testing process? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you well, much. thank you very thank much. You. And um, let me go ahead um, and make a comment here. So this is the very first time you've ever worn a filtering face piece respirator. Is, is that right? For this job? Word, yes. Okay. So let me make that as a comment. First time fitted to an N95 filtering face piece respirator. Um, and now what I can do is um, I can hit this print button. And when I hit this print button, now we have a report. Um, if I had a printer, I could hand it to you right now. Um, but I don't have a printer connected. Um, but I can email this to you, OK? I'm going to go ahead and go back to the presentation. OK, so great. So that was a demonstration on a worker that um, needed to be fit tested to a filtering face piece respirator. Um, let me make a couple of comments regarding that test. Uh, first of all, as you saw during the, vi during the video, I had him break the seal. That's a quality test, quality assurance. I call it a positive control step um, that I recommend be taken at the end of the test. So by reaching in and breaking that seal, right away he detected that sweetener agent. Um, just want to point out that is not an OSHA requirement. So you will not find that in their mandatory appendix um, A. I recommended that this be done many years ago. Um, recommended it to the ANSI committee. It is in the ANSI Z8810 guideline on respirator fit test methods. Um, and recently in 2017, with the development of the ISO standard on respirator fit testing, they also have that as a recommendation. Um, the, during the demonstration, I was using something called QualFit software that was able to document and record and print um, what OSHA requires the employer to do. Now, you don't have to have that software. You can develop your own paper way of doing this. The key thing is to recognize that OSHA requires that, the, that you identify the name of the individual that was being fit tested. Um, you need to identify the type of testing it was. In this case, it was a qualitative fit test. You want to identify what agent was used. In this case, it was sweetener. 
And then you need to identify the specific make, model, style, and size. So for that test, um, that information is provided to the worker. Um, you want to date the test. Um, the QualFit software automatically provides a date as well as a time and then the result. In this case, it was a pass. He did not detect that sweet taste. And then the OSHA standard requires that you retain, the employee retain those test results until the next fit test, which is typically done on an annual basis. In addition, many employers would want the fit tester to issue what we call a fit test certification card. That's a card that summarizes this information. It's a wallet size card. They can put it in their wallet. They can refer to their wallet anytime they kind of want to remember what make and model was that respirator, what size was it. Um, OSHA doesn't require that certification card, but it's a really good idea um, to provide that to the employee. So these nebulizers have a tendency um, to clog, and OSHA recognizes that. In fact, in the respiratory protection standard, in Appendix A, they say, quote, the nebulizer has a tendency to clog during use. The test operator, so that was me, must make a periodic checks of the nebulizer to ensure that it is not clogged. If clogging is found at the end of the test session, then that test is invalid. And this can occur, especially if you've been using the nebulizer uh, repeatedly throughout, say, the morning hours. Um, what happens is that the, um, with the sweetener, it begins to crystallize, and you may get clogging of the nebulizer. So you should check that at the, um, if you notice it during the test, that um, makes that test invalid. And then you need to repeat this, the test over again, beginning with another threshold screening, because that may have changed. Um, the way you do that is at the end of the test, just hold up the nebulizer. It's great to have a black background um, that you can look at to visualize the aerosol. Sometimes if you're, it's maybe a little bit easier just remove this cover here. And so this was the fit test solution, which does have a tendency to clog. And I guess you may be able to actually see that. But if I squeeze that bulb, it's very obvious that the nebulizer did not clog. It was generating that aerosol. Um, it's also recommended to rinse the nebulizers with clean water every four hours of use. Um, so if you're working an eight-hour day and, and you're a fit tester and this is what you do all day, um, what you would want to do is take this solution and just dump it in a sink, preferably. I'm going to put it in the trash can here. Um, and then I would go to a, a sink and I would run warm water um, into the nebulizer here. Um, and if you spray it while the warm water is in there, that really helps to clean it out, um, prevents those sweetener crystals um, from clogging the nebulizer. And if it should clog, the kits come with what we call a little wire pin. And you will not be able to see this in the video, but I can place this pin inside the what we call the question mark. This is the jet that creates the aerosol. And you can push that in and out to make sure that there is no clogging. You'll notice that when I was done, I discarded the solution. I threw it, in that case, in the trash can, or you would put it down the sink. You never want to take the solution from the nebulizer and return it back into your original container. That can cause contamination of the container, one. And then the other is while you're conducting the fit test, the liquid is evaporating off and remaining, some saccharin is remaining, or bitrex, either the two. And it actually changes the concentration inside that nebulizer. So bottom line, you don't want to pour any of the solutions back into the original containers. A um, couple of other tips. Now I use the software to help me um, ensure I use the correct exercises for the correct length of time. Each exercise is one minute and in the correct order. Uh, so um, it's important you maintain 
that, that timing and sequence. The other is you want to make sure that you don't excessively tilt the nebulizer. I'm going to take the nebulizer here, put a little bit of solution back in it, and this is particularly true when you get towards the end of the test and there's less liquid in there. So there's a pickup on this jet. And if I tilt the nebulizer excessively, let me go ahead and just put the cover on. And you will not be able to see this, but when you get the kit, you can look at it yourself. If I tilt the nebulizer excessively, now when I squeeze it, it doesn't pick up the liquid. You cannot generate the aerosol. If you don't generate aerosol, you have no challenge. If you have no challenge to that, to that face piece seal, then potentially a respirator that does not fit well may pass if you don't deliver the challenge agent. Um, the other thing you don't want to do is you don't want to spray the aerosol directly towards the respirator filter. So grab my, imagine I was wearing this respirator, a worker was wearing this respirator and they have the enclosure on. If I take the challenge agent here and if I have it very close to the filter, well then I'm spraying that aerosol right up against the filter. Well, you know what? NIOSH has already tested these filters. We know these work. What we want to do is we want to direct that aerosol around the periphery of the face piece and not spray it right up against the filter. That would diminish the airborne concentration. And when you diminish the airborne concentration, then you don't get an adequate challenge. And then lastly, when you squeeze the nebulizer, You need to use your entire hand. That may not have been obvious when you were watching me, but you squeeze with your fingers all the way into your hand. If I use my fingertips, and if you watch a lot of training videos, you'll notice they're squeezing it like this. Not very little, if anything, comes out if you do that. Let me show you by removing the top. And put a little bit more liquid in here. So watch what happens if I just slowly squeeze it with my fingertips. You probably don't see anything coming out. Now, if I squeeze it with my palm, you might be able to see a large amount of aerosol coming out. Again, I'll go with my fingertips. If you use your fingertips, don't squeeze it completely. Nothing, essentially, nothing comes out. Squeeze it, comp completely compress it, allow it to completely expand before the next squeeze. So I want to thank you for watching this video. Um, I appreciate it. If you have any suggestions, you have any comments, um, please um, email them to me at Roy at drmckay.com. That's Roy at drmckay.com. If you are interested in um, attending a respirator training course, we offer a number of respirator training courses for both the beginner as well as advanced fit testing and respirator selection and other issues. And if you're interested in the software that I use to help with the timing and the sequence of the exercises and the record keeping aspect of it, um, you can get that at qualfit.net. So once again, thank you very much. Um, and I hope to see you at a future training program.